we'll talk about that later, but they regrow that bone every single year, at least the males do. And that's very cool. Yep, they're, they're called cervids, which is deer critters, right? Moose, elk, um, rangifer. So I, I, I call them in scientific names. That's the caribou or the reindeer, all of a sudden. And then the giraffe horn, which we actually have a bull giraffe skull in the collection, which I don't move because it's huge. Uh, that's straight bone as well with just a skin sheath. Okay, so a variety of different things, different fancy things that uh, many mammals put on top of their heads. Right, antlers, straight up bone. Often regrow seasonally. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's fine. What is that? Shedding. It's peeling. But what is peeling? Looks like that, that deer is just the horrible deer. It's just. It's velvet. Okay. So it's velvet. What's velvet? It's skin. Now it's what we call highly vascularized skin. What's that mean? Blood flow, right? So that skin and hair has a ton of veins, arteries, and capillaries stringing through it. It's just full. And that's why it feels so spongy if you've ever feel it. It's very spongy and, and it's not dense it's because there's so, ma so much blood flowing through it. And that's why as they shed it, their antlers turn red because there's just a bunch of blood flowing, flowing through it. The antlers are not hard, but the skin is hard. The antlers are very hard, that's bone. But then the skin, the velvet that covers it gets shed off. Okay, why would they want a bunch of blood on their antlers? Yeah. What were you saying? Yeah. Yeah, so blood gets shuttled around our body. What does our blood do? Oxygen delivery keeps you on your feet. It provides a lot of really important proteins and sugars and all that stuff. So when you want to grow a bunch of bone, I mean, that's more bone than, than your femur every single year. Can you grow a femur every year? No. So they essentially cover that area in blood so they can get all of that good protein, all of that important stuff up to that area, which allows it to grow faster. And then once they're done growing, it gets really itchy. And so that's where you get deer scrapes on a, on a tree because it, it's really itchy and they're trying to get it off. Yeah, essentially. Right? So that's just really impressive. And then when you think about some of the really big bucks, or the moose, which I need a moose antler because I have a, a, an elk in there and I didn't bring it. But that's so much bone that they grow every single year. It's very impressive. Right? right? Another really cool thing about mammals is that they have very diverse teeth. Mammals are some of the only animals on the world in the world that have different types of teeth, right? If you think about a lizard or a fish, they just have spiky teeth, right? Almost like pins. But when you think about a mammal, what kind of teeth do mammals have? Yeah, it depends on the mammal. What about us? Incisors, molars, canines, right? Although our canines aren't nearly as vampiric as, as would be cool. Right, so we have a variety of different types of teeth, and other animals, other vertebrates, don't. The first type of tooth that made mammals just really good at what they did and helped mammals just outcompete a lot of the other critters are what we call tribosphenic molars. And that's a fancy word for the molars have three cusps, three points. If you feel your molars, maybe don't do it because we'll all have fingers, hands in our mouths. There's four cusps. In this case, it's three. Right? And then the Therians evolved to add an extra cusp, which makes our four cusp molars, which is what we have. Right? 
one, two, three, four. But the tribosphenic molars are really cool because not only did they have three prongs, one, two, three, they also had this weird extra like projection off the side. It's almost like another molar on that molar. And then you had a, an upper molar that came down and actually contacted this top and put a point down to this bottom. And I have some actual examples of those later or uh, in my office. But essentially what that allowed is it allowed one of the prongs to crush and then other prongs to actually act like scissors and shear right there. So not only could they crush vegetation, they could also shear flesh with the same chew, with the same bite. That's really cool. Just having that diversity in teeth let mammals essentially be really good omnivores versus the reptiles, which just have those pokey needle-like teeth. They could only be carnivores. Now we can start eating a variety of different things, making mammals very good at what they do, making them outcompete others, which is what they did. Okay. Right, shearing and crushing at the same time. That was just for the tribosphenic, right? Once we got our fourth cusp, we were pretty much just crushing with our molars. But then we had our, our canine and other things. Mm -hmm, exactly. Now, there's also a thing called the carnassial shears which is kind of one of the things that we got after we got rid of our tribosphenic molars. And these are super cool. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> I, I use my laser pointer in a lot of different things. These are your carnassial shears. How many people have dogs? What do they do when you give them a very hard thing to chew, like a deer antler or a Kong ball or something like that? They chew it at the very back of their mouths, right? They put it way back there and ah, blah, blah. they're using their carnassial shears, right? And that's a picture of one of the biggest carnassial shears that we have. And this is that skull, which is a hyena skull. This is a spotted hyena. It's this top one right there and that bottom one right there. And this is for shearing bone. This is for cracking into bone, right? or shearing flesh, but you really have the, the other things to do that, right? And that's what your dog is doing as it's breaking into that Kong ball. It's breaking bone. At least that's what it evolved to do, right? Too far back to get up with it. Exactly, right? So that's where you get most of the, the muscle force. I always lose my pointer. Where'd I put it? There it is. I paste a lot. Now this is a dire uh, um, hyena. It's now extinct. Oh, look at that. Carnassial shears. So what does that make this animal? What kind of food does this animal eat? It's potentially a carnivore. Omnivore, yeah, it can crush a little bit, but it's mostly for cutting things. It's breaking bone. What kind of animal? Is going to need to break bone. Predator or a scavenger. When it's only bone left, they can break over those bones and get the marrow out, which is partly what a spotted hyenas do. They just take over, they scavenge things. Uh, actually, our own uh, Dr. Farlow, who's a paleontologist here, actually did a dig nearby and he found a new type of dog called the bone crushing dog, which has huge carnassial shears that was right around, I think it was in Cherubusco that he happened to find that. Don't quote me on that. Looks like it. All right, so that's what makes a mammal a mammal. It's got milk, mammal milk, mammary milk. It's got hair, and that hair can be crazy. There's a bunch of different types of hair. And it's got uh, different types of teeth. And that is very much mammalian. Okay? 
Now we can go into the different types of mam mammals. And we can compare and contrast them. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to compare our non-therians to our therians. So we're going to compare our marsupials and uh, placental mammals to our monotremes. Right? And the biggest difference between them is oviparity and viviparity. Or oviparity. Oviparity is laying eggs. And there are egg-laying mammals on this earth, and that is the monotremes. So a duck-billed platypus lays eggs. Another type, I don't think we get to, another type of monotreme is this guy. I had to buy a realistic stuffed animal, because there's no way I'm going to actually get a stuffed, a real thing. That's an echidna, or a spiny anteater. It's actually not an anteater in any way, but it does eat ants. It's actually a monotreme that lays eggs. Right? An echidna, or a spiny anteater. Right? So oviparity lays eggs. That's the monotremes. Viviparity does what? Live birth, which is everything. There's also a reorganization of the pectoral girdle, the shoulders and things around here, the pecs. Right? And so the difference between the monotremes and the eutherians and therians in general is that the therians changed the skeleton around this pectoral, pectoral girdle. Right? They lost the coracoid and the interclavicle bones, which are shoulder bones. We only have one shoulder bone left, the scapula. So the monotremes have three shoulder bones. We have one. Now, there was an Ontarians that went extinct. They are the currently the extant, which means alive. And we also developed what's called a muscular sling, right? And that's just a whole bunch of muscles that attach our shoulder blades and other things like our appendages to our vertebra, our vertebral column. The monotremes have those three shoulder blades and they're all physically attached to the vertebral column. So the therians, the marsupials and the eutherians, they lost two bones and they disattached their shoulders from their vertebral column and it just held there with muscles. Hmm. That's weird. Our shoulders and our appendages aren't actually attached, physically attached to our, uh, our spinal cord, our spinal column. All right? The muscular sling is really good at shock absorbing. It's a bunch of muscles, so if, like if a cat lands on its feet, there's a bunch of muscle to essentially shock absorb all of that force so it doesn't go straight to their backbone. If you threw an echidna and it lands on its feet, it's going to break its, its spinal cord. It's not, it's not good. All right? So this is the difference here. Here's the echidna, and here is a possum. Kind of looks like it's got football pads on, right? Versus the uh, the possum, just has that single scapula. All right, let's do something that I do with my students. This is called a think pair share. This makes it so I don't have to talk, but you guys do, and then we can talk amongst ourselves. So the first thing you do is you think about this question, then you turn to someone else and start talking about. That, that answer, kind of come to a consensus, and then we'll share with the rest of the class and we'll talk about what that answer might be, right? So what is the benefit, the overall benefit of this reorganization of the scapula, of the, the pectoral girdle? I talked about shock absorption. You can't use that. 
But what's the big reason? Why would Therians go to such evolutionary trouble to get rid of two bones and disattach the shoulder blades from the vertebral column? Why do all that? What's the adaptive benefit? Okay, so think about it for a minute and then talk. No, I'll send my kid around. <laughs> They're so weird. <laughs> Yeah, that one has nothing. Yeah, you could have. That would have been a perfect stuffy to have the actual art, real bones, or not real bones, but lifelike bones in there. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, I'm checking it out. Well, you should take my ology. There could be a bunch, right? There's one major one, but if you guys come up with other things that sound right, I'm not going to say no. That's one thing about evolution is that there can be multiple benefits for each adaptation. All right. Let's rein it back in and then we can all talk together. So what did we come up with? What is the benefit for doing all of this evolutionary work? Agility, how so? Okay. All right. That sounds good. Someone back her up. Why would losing bones allow better agility? Range of motion. Okay. Sounds good. Anyone a football player or wear football pads in any way, shape, or form? No? Yeah. Do you think you can go like that in football pads? No. All right? So if you look at the echidna, its shoulder blades are football pads. So its legs and arms are straight down. They can't like go out anymore. So they have less range of motion, they can't run very fast, they can't lift their arms up or appendages up to get good strides, right? So they're not running as fast, they get eaten by predators. If there were any predators where they are, they would die immediately. They can't climb as well. Mm -hmm. So with that restriction, they can't grab things, right? So here's a great example. I was going to have you do this, but you probably hit everyone around you. You go like this, and then you go like that. An echidna can't do that, right? So if you're thinking about something climbing trees, like an opossum, it can only do that because it has two less bones, and its, well, it's uh, bones are disarticulated from the vertebral column, right? So that allowed for more agility, more range of motion, which allowed us to access the tree. It allowed us to run faster. And by running faster, we can now hunt better. Yes. Definitely. One thing about muscles and bones is you can only have as much muscle as you can fit around those bones. All right. So if you have less, you can tuck more muscles underneath. So that definitely helps. 
right? So that opened up a whole lot of what we call niches or roles that mammals could evolve into and start doing. Any other benefits you guys came up with? As I mentioned, that's one of the big ones. That doesn't necessarily have to be the only one. Potentially, we actually lose ribs, right? And that allowed for more range of motion as well, because if you think, like, that's all football pads right there, right? So that helped a lot, of, uh, a lot. Like here, the, the thoracic, the lower back, is a lot smaller here than it is right there. Yeah? Mm, any energy expenditure? Yeah, so if, they, if these guys wanted to run faster, they're gonna use a heck of a lot more energy than these guys did, because they can, just having longer legs allows them to move faster and not spend as much energy. Yeah. Others? All right, we'll do another one of these things. Okay, so that's the big deal. Yes? Yes, they do. Just that one schedule, exactly. It's attached by muscle, but it's not attached by bone. Yep. All right, so major lineages. Now we're comparing marsupials to eutherians. So the marsupials to the placental mammals. No, the marsupials are still therians, right? That's how they differ from monotremes. They uh, have live birth. They only have one shoulder bone. So now we're differentiating between the groups within the therian lineage. And that's the marsupials and the eutherians. Make sense? Okay. Reproduction. The biggest difference between marsupials and eutherians. So let's, let's start naming off some, some marsupials. What are some marsupials that we have? Kangaroos, possum, a wallaby. Yeah, it's a type of kangaroo, but it's much smaller. That's kind of what everyone knows. There's one. Uh, panda is actually a bear, but there's another bear that's not. The koala bear. It's not a bear. Um, it's also just weird. Anyway, um, and they can be vicious. So next time you see a stuffed koala, you're vicious now. Anyway. Um, so you got koalas, wombats, and that's actually not the most diversity of, of marsupials. You have things like sugar gliders. You have things uh, like um, uh, the paramelomorphids. Don't write that down. Um, there's all sorts of smaller marsupials that you get in uh, Australia. There's tons of diversity of them. But the main difference between them and eutherians, things like bears, humans, other primates, rodents, is reproduction. Most marsupials have a pouch. Not all. There are some marsupials that do not have a pouch. They are the exception to the rule. Like a koala, right? Our uh, opossum, which we'll talk about later, does have a pouch, but it actually opens to the side or some other angle, it's kind of weird. It's not like this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So these guys have a pouch, and that allows them to do some really cool stuff with reproduction, right? So what happens here is the kangaroo, like the red kangaroo, which is the master of reproduction, is that they will give birth to what we call a neonate, which is like a one inch long baby. Like a one inch. That neonate then crawls up to the pouch, falls down in, and at the bottom of that pouch are nipples. It'll then chomp onto that nipple, and then the nipple will enlarge and essentially just make that connection, and it'll hang out there drinking milk for a couple of months. At the same time, that mother will have a joy in the pouch with that neonate and a joey out of the pouch. So it can have three different age groups of offspring going at the same exact time. 
Once that joey goes out of the pouch and is just hanging around the mother, the neonate is then the joey in the pouch and it gives birth to another neonate. And it keeps going and going and going. Yeah. So the biggest thing, difference between these guys and eutherians is the amount of time they spend in utero. The amount of time of gestation, so within the womb. For the marsupials, it's nothing. A little bit of gestation time, a little bit of time in the womb, and then boop, out. Much more time drinking milk. That's the big thing. Marsupials drink, marsupial babies drink milk for much longer than eutherians. Nope. It's, when, as you get bigger in size, they spend, they spend more time drinking milk. But if there was a marsupial our size, they're going to drink milk for much longer than human, human beings. You potentially, yeah. The red kangaroos can get pretty big. And they, they won't be for years, but so I guess we're a little bit of an exception. Um, and humans are just weird. It can be s about a year or maybe even more. Well, they'll go in and out once they get better. Yep. The joey out of the pouch never goes back in. It's kicked out. All right. Another thing that differentiates marsupials from eutherians is that marsupials have an epipubic bone, which is kind of a reptilian trait. It, it's these little spurs that come off of the pelvis. We don't know what they're for. They're just there. They might be vestigial, meaning they used to have a function, but now there's just no function. They're just there. But that's useful for us, because if we happen to find a skeleton, if there's epipubic bones on there, we instantly know that it's a possum. It's a marsupial. Dental formula. This is how we um, ID the, the diversity in teeth, is we count teeth. Right? It's reported for w only one side of the jaw. So if you take your jaw, you put your hand right there, dental formula is only recorded for one side. Right? So right there on that side. Right? And it's reported for upper.